In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Um, let's see. So today we are entering into the fifth Sunday of the blessed month of Baba. And it's also the 29th of the month, which is unique. So there's the 29th of the month is important in the Coptic church because um, every time that we hit a 29th of the month, uh, we focus on uh, the Annunciation, Nativity, and Resurrection. So the 29th of every Coptic month celebrates the, the three major feasts, um, the Annunciation, Nativity, and Resurrection. Uh, why? Because m those feasts tend to fall on the 29th of their respective months. And so as a memorial to those feasts, every uh, 29th of the Coptic month, um, for, for, with a couple of exceptions, are for the commemoration of these feasts. And so the readings of today, focus on the Annunciation. Um, and it's found in the Gospel of uh, St. Luke, chapter 1, verses 26 to 38. So I'm going to focus on just a few aspects of the Annunciation and a little bit of the resurrection. Um, when we think about the Feast of Annunciation, we reflect on just a few uh, important aspects. First, we, we lift up and we honor St. Mary. Uh, we emphasize what happened to her and how she responds to God's call. Second, each one of us is challenged to take heart of ourselves, the message of the Annunciation and to reflect how that we're supposed to respond in a similar way. So I'd like to look at these aspects a little bit more closely and we can go a little bit more in depth. And so first I wanna focus on St. Mary. Think of, think of her, she's a young girl who has lived most of her life growing up in a temple of Jerusalem, preparing to dedicate her life to our Lord Jesus Christ, to God. And even with this type of preparation, it still must have been a shock for her to encounter Archangel Gabriel. To come into contact with any angel seems to be um, an amazing big experience in the Bible, but to stand face to face with Archangel Gabriel must have truly been awe-inspiring. And so the Archangel shocks her when he says, Hail to Mary, Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with you. Uh, what type of greeting is this? Um, well, she is the chosen one in all of history. Uh, none of us can imagine what it would be like to be the one in history uh, that God has chosen to become his mother. St. Mary, the mother of God, the queen of us all, uh, the mother of us all. She is the chosen one throughout every single generation in history in mankind. Um, and yet with the utmost humility, she offers different responses to Archangel Gabriel. And I think these responses are something that we can learn from and something that we can meditate from. She begins by saying, behold, I am the, maid, the handmaiden of the Lord. Let it be to me according to uh, the will of God or to, to your will. So yes, she is the chosen one. Um, and she understands herself as a humble servant, uh, a faithful servant who is ready to do whatever the will of God is. So she says, let it be to me according to your will. Next, when Archangel explains to her what will happen to her, uh, she responds by saying, my soul magnifies the Lord. In other words, her soul wants to solely glorify, praise, uh, lift up God, right? So she does not respond with any proud or arrogant way, thinking of herself as someone special because she was chosen. Basically, she responds, I know life is not about me, uh, but it is all about you, Lord. And my soul simply wants to praise and lift up your holy name in my life. My life is dedicated to honor and to glory you and you alone. And so finally, St. Mary emphasizes and says, my spirit rejoices in God, my savior. This is her third response. So when we dedicate our lives to following our Lord, we discover a great treasure and joy in our lives. St. Mary says, my joy and my delight lie solely in God uh, and nothing else in this world. Another one of the great saints that we know, St. Paul, he would later write in his epistle, um, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Even the prophet Nehemiah once wrote, the joy of the Lord is my strength. So a life in Christ is all about joy. So for St. Mary, dedicating her life to following the will of God brings her immense joy. And so her soul rejoiced in her, in God, her Savior. And we think for a moment about 
St. Mary's uh, different responses to Archangel Gabriel. I'm going to list them again. Let it be to me according to your will. My soul magnifies the Lord and my, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. These three beautiful lessons uh, that St. Mary teaches us during the passage of the Annunciation. So we celebrate and we honor uh, the Theotokos, St. Mary, the mother of God. But in the most appropriate way that we can honor her is by imitating her. <clears throat> so when we say, let it be to me according to your will, for my soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. In each one of our own lives, what happens when God comes to us? And he does come to us. The book of Revelation tells us that Jesus stands at the door knocking. He stands at the door of our heart knocking in Revelations chapter 3, verse 20. So how do we respond to his knock? How do we respond to his call? How do we respond to his invitation? Are we ready to live our lives seeking out his will? Can we say, as did uh, the young St. Mary, let it be to me according to your will, not my will, but your will be done in my life. Our, or, or will we say, our, or will we let our egos get in the way? Will we put and allow our egocentric desires to pull us in a different direction? As children of God, created in the image of God, called to the greatness of God, can we fully trust him and say, yes, Lord, let it be to me according to your will. For we know he is our loving father and he only wants what's best for us. Our Lord teaches us to seek first the kingdom of God. And the way is narrow and is difficult into the kingdom of, 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 of God. Because of our own desires and our own passions, they want to take priority. So the Virgin St. Mary, though, she sets an example for us. And she gives up her freedom by freely giving her own will over to the Lord. She says, let it be to me according to your will. And that has to become our prayer as well. Then when we learn to give up our will and we follow God's ways, our souls will truly be filled with the joy of the Lord. And we will be able to continue to magnify the Lord and rejoice in, in God always. So the joy of our Lord will become our source and of strength and the, and the fountain in our lives. The question is, how much do we really want the will of God in our lives? If we desire it deeply, he will empower us to fulfill it. But the question is, do we desire to do the will of God with all of our hearts? Or do we just say it with our, with our words? If not, then God must wait for us to get to the point when our hearts are open before he reveals to us what he wants us to do. So we have to make a commitment to nurturing ourselves to a life that is full of grace. What does that mean? How do we do this? We have to stop long enough to look deeply into our lives. This is what we need to do often, not just once or twice in a lifetime, but once or twice a day, consistently, faithfully. Self-knowledge is a gift that comes to those who seek it. And this is the beginning of repentance when we look inward. And so the goal is to allow the heart to settle like calm water so that the face of Christ and our neighbor can reflect crystal clear in the stillness. So as long as there's turmoil, as long as there's movement within, um, we can expect the same outside of us as well. So if there's turmoil within us, if there's chaos within us, we're gonna feel that same way with the external things around us. Second, we need to straighten out those things in us that we find that are crooked or bent. When we look inside and we find the things that are unhelpful, the things that cause pain, the things that start to um, take away our peace, we have to get rid of them. We have to take rid of them little by little. There is so much that we can do to help ourselves, but we don't do it. So we have to trust, we have to trust that God, seeing our desire and seeing our effort will come to our aid. So where our thoughts and our words and our deeds are harmful to ourselves and to others, we need to commit to changing them. It has to be a choice and there has to be a follow through. It's possible to make real progress in, in living as children of, of God by watching what we think and what we say and what we do, just those simple things. 
St. Mary's training in the temple, most certainly have had this in mind. For example, we know that it's God's will that we love one another. Can we root out, can we not begin to root out of us everything that's opposed to love? This means, um, that's what it means to purify one's heart, right? St. Augustine warns that if your eyes are clogged with sand, would you not have to wash them out before you can see the light? He goes on to say, take a look at your heart. Everything you see in it that might sadden God, remove. God wants you to become. So we must learn to guard our hearts from all that would keep us from the narrow path and prayer. One of the church fathers says, this is the true foundation of prayer, keeping watch over your own thoughts and giving yourself to prayer in great tranquility and great peace, push ahead towards God. Most of us, most of all, we need to believe that God loves us and wants to uh, come to us. God desires above all to reveal himself to us. So we have to ask ourselves this question, how often in my 24 hour day period, do I consciously reach out towards God? And I try to touch God. He's there all the time. Do we live as if God lives? He can be touched at every single moment in our lives. The only thing that is lacking is the effort needed, which is really, in the end, very small. And so we have to be like St. Mary in this respect. We share the same nature and have the same potential. We only differ in that potential fulfillment. The Lord will not force us to walk the way of truth and liberation. He will not force us to walk in the way of self-denial and compassion. He won't force us to walk in the way of purification. The choice is ours. And the power is, is through Christ in order to make that happen. And it is, it is a power granted to everyone born in this world. It's not just unique to Egyptian Coptics, right? You want to know the will of God? Here it is. He wills that everyone wants to be saved. He wants everyone to be saved. And so those are some little uh, contemplations on the Annunciation. I want to briefly talk about the resurrection. Why? Because again, the 29th of the month focuses on the three major feasts. And so as we're thinking about the resurrection and we're comparing it to the Annunciation, I can't help but think of angels, angels in the picture. And so there's another interaction that angels that happen in time of the resurrection. Uh, it says in Luke chapter 24, verse four, two men stood by them in shining garments. These are the angels that notice, um, and we notice how the Orthodox Christian, the, the priests, the, they wear white, they wear shining garments, right? For vestments. The angels tell the women that Christ is not here at the tomb, but he's risen. I hope you guys remember this. Um, and then to dispel any doubt the women may have about the resurrection, the angel says in verses six and seven, he says, uh, remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, the son of man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. In other words, he already told you that he was going to be resurrected, remember? So this, is, this was the role of the angel during the resurrection. And so this is the church's role and the role of the priest to remind us over and over again of what Christ said. We may say that every year I hear the same gospel, <clears throat> right? Uh, I hear the same sermons year after year, over and over again. I hear the same stuff all the time. Well, yes, we may already have heard it and we may know it, but we may also have forgotten it too. And most importantly, if we're truly seeking to learn and to grow in our relationship with Christ, then we may hear the exact same gospel or epistle and have a deeper understanding or a deeper meaning the next time we encounter it. We may hear the same exact sermon but we may pick up a different point and try to apply that point in our lives, depending on our circumstances this year. We may hear the same guidelines for the various fasting periods, but whatever the case may be, we may be more determined to act and to fill them in a more meaningful way, depending on the year that we're in. 
So we have to understand that the spiritual life is never an, an ending or a, a journey inward. It's, it's never an ending. It's a journey inward uh, to the depths of our souls because that's where God is. Um, and that's where God seeks to live and to dwell within us. As we dig deeper, we come across a lot of stuff inside of our hearts and our minds that we forgot that was there. Maybe we've uh, suppressed a lot of memories or um, uh, thoughts that, you know, as we encounter them and as we look inward, we realize that we need healing. Maybe there's bad habits. Maybe there's bad habits that need correcting. Um, maybe there's thoughts that need discipline. And maybe there's attitudes that need enlightenment. But most importantly, uh, we find when we find sins that need to be confessed um, and experiences with others that need to be forgiven. Unfortunately, because of our fallen uh, human nature, we have to be reminded. We have to be reminded of the journey inward um, and how to, um, how to navigate through the obstacles that we might find. Many people give up on their search for Christ because they don't know how to search within themselves or they're not willing to. They're not willing to go there. Um, and they don't want to allow themselves to be vulnerable uh, for the heavy work that's required. And they are convinced that there's an easier way. The Christian life, the journey towards holiness is never easy and it is hard work. Um, it's one said that there are no gifts without trials. You know, we ask a lot from God for our benefit, but the question is, have we proved that we are worthy of these gifts by patiently waiting for him and remaining faithful uh, to him in the midst of, of suffering and uh, difficult challenges in our lives? We have to be reminded of these important indispensable messages. So to conclude, um, we're going to be talking about the nativity soon enough, right? Annunciation, nativity. We're going to be talking about those. Kiak is just around the corner. Uh, but I want us to remember a little bit of the resurrection, right? We say very early in the morning. It's a very meaningful response for us. Very early in the morning, because it's one of the ways that the women um, exemplify the faithfulness uh, to Christ. To show us that we should rise early every morning to come to the church if we can, ready to anoint the body with, of Christ with our tears and our prayers. The church uh, temple, the church building, uh, is the empty tomb uh, where we celebrate the resurrection of Christ. And so let us also remember the Annunciation. Let's too remember St. Mary, and we must be wise. We cannot um, over-spiritualize every experience in our lives as if God is sending us a message every single second of the day, we have to be discerning. But on the other hand, we can't, um, we have to understand that God does send us angels and he does send us messengers, often the faithful, often the believing uh, community that we are around who love and care for us and to guide us and to direct us in every way in life. So having said that, not every angel or spirit is of God. So we have to be wise and we have to be discerning. When confronted with the call of Christ to accomplish his will uh, in the world, he, we must be faithful and obedient. We must, of our own free will, uh, consent and accept this call and divine purpose. Our yes to God each day will be the new beginning of salvation for us and actually for many people around us. And so this... St. Mary is not the one and only tabernacle or dwelling place of God. Our faithful yes and our obedient yes to God allows God to dwell within each one of us. So another point as we think about the Annunciation coming up is the icon of the Annunciation is very appropriately placed on the icon stasis because um, it's placed where we approach God in, with communion and faith. Uh, we, we approach God with love and fear and we receive our Lord Jesus Christ incarnate in communion so that he can be within us. So the Feast of Annunciation is not just about the joy of the crown of our salvation, but also a lesson for us 
about how to trust in God, how to listen to his call. You know, he alone knows what is good for us. And if this is the case, then we should be filled with trust in him. So let us look at St. Mary the Theotokos as our hero, as our example of what happens when a humble and obedient person says yes to God from the depths of her soul. So let us honor her by knowing her and imitating her in purity and holiness and glory be to God forever. Amen.